the industry related manufacturing technology video series. This is for industrial technology stage six, the preliminary course. I'm looking under the materials heading and I'm looking down to the fourth dot point on timber defects. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So defects within timber. When we're thinking about timber, um, what we need to know, we need to know about the types of defects. Now the syllabus isn't really clear here in terms of what we need to be able to do with that information in terms of whether we need to be able to discuss it, explain it or things like that. But it's pretty clear to me that you need to be aware of timber defects, particularly during the process of selecting the timber that you plan to use for your project. Now, with that in mind, my normal process that I would recommend to you is when you're thinking about your major work for next year, you would come up with your designs, you'd come up with a few different options of timber species, you'd make some uh, research and recommendations, you'd finally decide which species to use, then you would go to the shop and you would actually purchase the timber. Now, when you purchase the timber, if you have the opportunity to inspect the pieces of timber physically, stand in front of them and look at them, you would actually be looking for these sorts of defects to make sure that the boards that you purchase and take back to your house or back to school to continue working on your project aren't impacted uh, by, these, by these sorts of things. And these are things that you can identify visually just by looking at the timber uh, typically. So that's what we want to be aware of. Um, Unfortunately, when you purchase your timber online, so if you call up the supplier and ask them to deliver it to the, to the school or the job site, um, or if you do it online and, and pay for delivery to occur, you don't get that opportunity to select it. So you're really relying on someone else doing those inspections for you. Um, so really, if the opportunity exists, head out to the supplier and, uh, and check it out. So let's have a look through some defects. First thing we'll talk about when we're talking about defects, this isn't uh, strictly speaking in the syllabus there, so not something we have to cover, but something that's worth noticing. When we consider timber, there are two main sorts of things that can attack it that aren't actually considered to be um, a defect in, in this definition that we're thinking of, but there are definitely things that impact on the timber and something you'd be uh, thinking about in terms of the use of the timber. We spoke in our properties and characteristics of timber. We spoke about the uh, durability of materials and how we would go about picking uh, species of timber that might be used outside where they would be exposed to the elements. One of the risks with outdoor timber um, or timber exposed to the elements or even timber that's exposed directly to the ground um, is insect and fungal uh, infection. So. On an insect side of things, the insects go in, they eat through the timber, um, they hollow it out by eating through the fibers. Once it goes uh, is hollowed out, it's obviously very brittle and then can break apart. So it loses its structural integrity. You've probably heard uh, very commonly about termites, um, but there are all sorts of other species, carpenter ants, etc., cetera, um, that would go through, even borers, even worms would go through timber. Um, and so you can suffer from insect damage. There's something to be aware of. The other one is fungal damage. Now, fungal damage um, usually looks like uh, slimy, gooey, mushroomy, um, puffy, powdery. There's usually a visual sign of that. Insect decay, you normally don't notice until the timber is completely destroyed and starts to crumble apart because on the outside, it still looks um, in good condition. But then when you actually touch it and squeeze it, it might crumble in your hands. Whereas with fungal, de fungal decay, um, you sometimes can see it on the outside, so you get a little bit more warning that you've got an attack there. Um, but there are all sorts of things that can cause fungus. So fungus can also attract, uh, attack the trees while they're growing, um, just like the insects can. So if you're looking at some of the species um, like messmate, um, wormy chestnuts, things like that, we actually consider the insect damage actually to be a bit of a feature there because it gives some real good character to the timber. So there's also a little bit of positive to consider. Anyway, let's get into defects. Knots, you should be so aware of knots. If you don't know what a knot is by now, um, then I've got to say, I'd be really shocked. Knots are formed by the branches. They start growing on the trunk. They grow outwards. And as a result, the grain in that timber changes direction. Typically the tree trunk, the grain is going directly up and down the tree. Okay, it's, it's following the vessels in the xylem, the phloem, the cambium layer, all those things we spoke about back in the structure uh, series. So the grain is normally directly up and down in a tree. 
whenever a branch deviates and sticks out from the side, obviously that grain is starting to change direction. And the grain follows the direction that the branch goes. So in that connection point between trunk and branch, the grain is sort of moving around and changing its, uh, changing its straightness. Um, and as a result, that can actually cause the uh, timber to become quite weak, depending on how much grain has changed um, and whether the knot is a hole through knot. So a knot that goes the whole way through your board can actually fall out, uh, leaving a hole in your timber. So if you do have a knot, you can work around it. You can fill it with epoxy. Uh, you can also just lacquer over it. You could fill it with glue as well. Um, but epoxy seems to be the common go-to these days. Fill it with epoxy. And then that sort of stops the knot from falling out and causing any further damage um, in terms of missing parts of the timber. Your, uh, your knot as well, when you're thinking about it, you've got to remember that's end grain sitting inside the surface of a board. So it actually will absorb finishes slightly differently um, to how your board will accept them. And so that's something to consider. If you're looking at a timber, you want lots of character, you might be tempted to go for knots. But if you're, if you're going for an oil-based finish um, or um, polyurethanes or things like that, they're, they're really absorbing the timber. You, you might find you run into a bit of issue there. That being said, there are other defects um, that occur. We spoke about them earlier, like... Um, insect and fungal attacks that can actually make your timber look really good. There's also stress methods. So you can get the same character from knots without the actual damage of the grain direction and the knot potentially falling out. Cupping is a bit of an issue. We get this quite a lot. It tends to happen um, as a result of seasoning. So if the timber is dried too fast um, or dried um, unevenly or um, there's not enough airflow around, these sorts of things can cause cupping. Now, if we're looking at the image here, I'm just going to um, just going to move my mouse over and hopefully get um, some annotation tools. Uh, turning on the laser pointer here, you've got the thickness of the timber, you've got the length of the timber. Cupping occurs across the width. Okay, it's important to note that because there are other defects for the other different dimensions. So they different terms for for which part of the timber is damaged. So cupping, you go across the width. And if it's not perfectly flat or perfectly level, if it's got that sort of cup shape sitting into it, that's considered cupping. Now where this typically happens is if the timber on the inside dries out really quickly, it actually closes together okay, and causes that cupping shape to occur. Um, so it pulls these sides into each other. We then look at bowing. When we're considering bowing, it's the same concept. So it's it's that sort of cup shape, but the difference here, sorry, I'll just go back there. The difference here now is that we're, we're looking at this along the length of the timber. So it's no longer across the width. It's, no, it's not on the thickness. It's across the length of the timber. Again, this is usually seasoning related, um, but I've also seen it happen if you leave a board outside and it's, um, not sitting perfectly flat, or you haven't got it on a flat shelf, it's not stacked properly, the timber gradually might sag over time, or maybe you've got weight on it's causing it uh, to be pushed down. Bowing can be one of those things um, that is manually um, occurred, but generally speaking, this happens from seasoning. We move across again, and we look at splits. Now, a split occurs down the length, but across the thickness. So it's the full way through the thickness is important to know with the split. So the top is broken and the bottom is broken. So it's broken the whole way through. And again, this is usually seasoning related. Now, you've got to remember seasoning. The timber is green. It's got 100% moisture. And in Sydney, we bring it down to that EMC of around about the 15%. If you bring it from 100 down to 15% too fast, then the board may split crack, check, bow, cup, any of those sorts of things because it's not reacting fast enough. So what needs to happen is you actually need to do seasoning on a really slow or really controlled manner so that we try to avoid these things from happening. You may have heard of kiln drying or air drying timber. Timber that's air dried typically takes a lot longer, but it's a little bit more natural in the way that it dries. 
And so you may not see as many of these defects occur. Kiln dry and timber, if it's not done correctly, so like if it's not done in an industrial kiln, if it's done in your home kiln or something like that, if you're not paying close attention to uh, the moisture rates, you're probably going to find that you're actually adding defects. You get the timber dry fast, but you, uh, in, in terms of getting the speed, you lose out because you, you get some of the defects. So splitting the whole way through the thickness, split at the top, split at the bottom, usually occurring because of seasoning. Checking. Checking is very much like splitting, but pay attention. It is only partially split. So if we remember the split was split at the top and split at the bottom the whole way through, when we're considering a check, it's actually only split at the top or the bottom, okay, one or the other, um, hasn't gone the whole way through. It's a partial split, okay? So that's called checking. Similar process related to uh, seasoning. You're probably starting to see that seasoning causes lots of issues here. Now, shake. Shake looks very much like a split and very much like a check, okay? But there is a main difference to, to pay attention to. If you're looking at the shake, you can see that on the thickness, so when we're looking at the end grain, the shake actually follows the curve of the grain. Whereas if I go back to checks, it's not necessarily following the shape of the grain. You can see this grain here is sort of uh, tipping over to the left, whereas this split's tipping over to the right. So it's actually deviated from the uh, deviated from the grain pattern. Whereas when it's following the growth rings, following those rings of grain, that's when we consider it to be a shake. And these could be whole way through or part way through. So there we go. Now, the other thing to keep in mind with each of these defects. Now, I spoke a lot about how these may be a result of uh, seasoning as a primary reason. Absolutely, that can be the case. Knots, that's naturally occurring. Insects, fungus, naturally occurring. But for all these other ones, cups, bows, shakes, cup, uh, checks, etc. Generally speaking, can be shrinkage. The other thing to keep in mind is when the timber conversion happens. So if we're remembering back to, you probably learned this back in year nine and 10, live sawing, back sawing, quarter sawing timber. All of those, um, all of these defects are actually heightened by using, um, by using the conversion methods. If we think about quarter sawing, we know that it takes longer. We know there's a little bit more waste, but we know it's a more stable board. Okay, less likely to have these sorts of defects as well. Whereas if we compare that to live sawn, um, which is at the, the very end of the scale in terms of the conversion, much faster to do, but it's obviously going to have a whole heap more defects because the blade is just going the whole way through that trunk. That's when you start to find that there's an increase in the defects as well when the seasoning happens. So they may not cup directly when you do the, the live sawing, but during the seasoning process after being live sawn, if you've got two things, poor seasoning and live sawing happening, you're probably going to have a whole heap of defects there. So if that's the end of the defects one, it's a really quick one. Um, you just need to be aware of the names of these things. You need to be aware of the sorts of things to look at. Um, obviously, any hole, like a shake, a split, a, a check, etc., is going to cause a weakness to your board, but it can add a little bit of character because you've got those nice deep lines. You can fill them with epoxy and and maybe get away with it for a few years if your timber is finished drying out. But if there's that little bit of moisture in it yet or um, you're not sure about it, these sorts of things would be what you worry about. In terms of boards that I'd totally avoid, I wouldn't go anywhere near a board that's bowed or anywhere near a board that's cupped. And that's definitely something you need to pay attention to when you're selecting the species. Anyway, hope that was good and uh, look forward to seeing you in our next video where we start looking at manufactured boards.